Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8:16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8:31. I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Erin Viner. And I'm Rebecca Rand. Our top story, spiraling Arab violence across Israel, Judea, and Samaria. More Israeli citizens were murdered in terror attacks over the past month than in the previous two years, and 100 others have been left wounded. Two people were killed in separate knife attacks in just one day this past week. 26-year-old Dalia Lemkis of Tekoa was stabbed to death by Maher al-Hashlamuni as she waited at a bus stop outside the community of Alon Shfut in Gush Etzion. After the 30-year-old terrorist from Hebron stabbed Lemkus and two others, he returned to make certain she was dead. He initially tried to ram his vehicle into a crowd of people, but was blocked by billboards. He has been identified as a member of the Islamic Jihad terror group, who served time in Israeli prison for security violations. His rampage came to an end after he was shot and killed by a guard on duty near the site. Just hours before, a 20-year-old soldier was also stabbed to death by a Palestinian who tried to steal his weapon at a Tel Aviv train station. Sergeant Almog Shiloni of Modain fought off his assailant, but was mortally stabbed in the stomach and succumbed to his massive wounds in a hospital a short time later. His 18-year-old assailant, Nur al-Din Abu Hashia, was captured after fleeing the scene. The resident of the Palestinian Authority-controlled city of Nablus had illegally infiltrated the country. After the day's carnage, Palestinians tweeted and retweeted the message, boasting that the knife intifada has begun. In the second vehicular terror attack in Jerusalem within seven days, Ibrahim al-Akari drove his van into a group of people on the light rail platform last week. 38-year-old border officer Jaden Assad was killed in the attack. Assad is survived by his three-year-old son Amir and his pregnant wife Doreen. Fourteen others were wounded in the attack, including Shalom Badani, who was mortally injured and died of his wounds two days later. The 17-year-old was the grandson of prominent Rabbi Shimon Badani, who is a member of the Shas Party Council of Torah Sages. The terrorist was shot dead by security forces during his rampage when he left his van to attack passersby and police with a metal rod. The terrorist's relatives set up a traditional mourning tent at their home in the Shuafat neighborhood of Jerusalem, where they said they are not at all sorry about his attack because the Jews deserved what happened to them. Israeli government ministers are demanding a halt in the escalating violence by the Israeli Arab sector and calling on the community's leaders to condemn rather than promote ongoing clashes. The local council of the Arab town of Kfar Kana declared a general strike and organized a mass demonstration when 22-year-old Kheredin Hamdan was fatally shot by police after he attacked them with a knife in an incident captured on video surveillance tape. Thousands of rioters blocked roads at several locations where they set fire to tires and hurled rocks at authorities. In other mass disturbances, a Jewish man narrowly averted being lynched in the Israeli Arab town of Taibe when masked rioters beat him after dragging him out of his car, which they then torched. A mother and her five children came under attack by Arabs throwing a firebomb and rocks at their vehicle between Malay Shomron and al Matan, and a homemade pipe bomb was thrown at police in Fouradis. Rocks were thrown at buses near the Bakajat Interchange and Highway 6, as well as the Nawadi Ara area, and on Highway 1 near the town of Abu Ghosh outside of Jerusalem. Residents of Arab neighborhoods in the Israeli capital and in the Galilee towns of Turan and Shfaram also hurled rocks and firebombs at security forces. Almost miraculously, no injuries were reported in any of those incidents. 
Newly appointed European Union Foreign Policy Chief Frederica Mogherini wrapped up her two-day visit to the region, where she denounced Israel's settlement policy and urged all sides to return to negotiations. During a joint press conference in Jerusalem, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke of his attempts to further calm the situation by not only telephoning Jordan's King Abdullah, but making a swift trip to Amman for a face-to-face -face meeting. Netanyahu said he wanted to assure the monarch that there will be no change to policies on the Temple Mount in the Old City. Until now, the status quo dictated by the Muslim Waqf prohibits Jews and Christians from praying at the holy site and allows non-Muslims sporadic and heavily restricted access. The area has been a flashpoint of Arab violence, and Netanyahu said that he and King Abdullah agreed to work together to reject violence and incitement in efforts to restore calm. Despite that agreement, following a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, Jordanian Foreign Minister Nasser Judah announced that his country's ambassador to Israel was being recalled because of Israel's alleged violations, and that Amman intends to lodge a formal complaint at the U.N. Security Council. His government also nixed participation in a ceremony slated to mark 20 years of the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. It is unclear at this time if the event co commemorating the 1994 accord has been merely postponed or canceled altogether. In other news, Congress is set to engage in a vigorous debate with the White House on how to combat the Islamic State force in Iraq and Syria. Following the extended election season break, the legislators must decide on whether to approve President Barack Obama's $5.6 billion request to degrade and destroy the ruthless terrorists. The temporary authorization Congress granted Obama in September to train and arm Syrian forces in the U.S.-led coalition battle against the Sunni Muslim extremists is set to expire early next month, and debate may continue into January when the Republican-controlled Congress takes office. The Israeli army has received validation for its conduct during the summer conflict with Gaza from the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey. During an appearance before the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs in New York City, Dempsey said that Israel went to extraordinary lengths to limit civilian casualties in Gaza. Dempsey went on the record stating all that interested the IDF was stopping the shooting of rockets and missiles out of the Gaza Strip into Israel. And it did its very best to avoid the deaths of civilians. He went on to detail the remarkable measures used by the IDF to notify Gaza residents of impending airstrikes, including the dropping of leaflets, as well as the technique known as roof knocking, which is the firing of a warning shot creating a deafening boom throughout the building. This provides civilians with ample time to leave the area ahead of any strikes. Dempsey also made note that the IDF was faced with a significant challenge to avoid the deaths of non-combatants because Hamas had turned Gaza into very nearly a subterranean society of terror tunnels built throughout the coastal enclave. In further signs of increasing tensions within the Palestinian unity government, a memorial rally to mark the 10th anniversary of late PLO and terrorist leader Yasser Arafat's death was canceled. The event was to be held in Gaza, but Fatah officials in Ramallah say that they were informed by the Hamas-dominated Interior Ministry that it was unable to provide security. Hamas also reportedly ordered Gaza transportation companies to refuse to rent buses to rally organizers. The latest friction followed 15 explosions targeting the homes and vehicles of Fatah officials in the Gaza Strip, as well as the wooden stage where the Arafat Memorial was set to be held. Officials from both sides are blaming each other for the blasts, which caused minor damage but no injuries. A bloody internecine civil war between the factions in 2007 resulted in Hamas control of the Gaza Strip. While Fatah and Hamas agreed to form a reconciliation government this past June, deep animosity between the two persists, and the so-called unity cabinet has so far failed to yield any significant accomplishments. Divisions between Egypt and Hamas are also deepening. Hamas is now being classified as a significant security risk to Egypt, and authorities are now accelerating the pace of creating the Rafah buffer zone on the border with Gaza. The security strip is being carved out in response to the recent attack in the Sinai that killed 33 Egyptian soldiers. Cairo is accusing Hamas of involvement in the attack, and the army is in the process of eliminating any remaining smuggling tunnels from Gaza. 800 Palestinian homes are being evacuated and demolished as part of the plan. 
Egyptian security services have also decided to revoke the citizenship of 13,757 Palestinians who are charged with having become Egyptian citizens as part of a conspiracy to carry out terrorist attacks on behalf of Hamas. We here at Israel Now News and many in the state of Israel join those around the world in mourning the deaths of Dr. Miles Monroe and eight others, including his wife and co-pastor, Ruth. The founder of the Bahamas Faith Ministries was a fervent supporter of the State of Israel and an internationally renowned author, Bible teacher, governmental consultant and leadership mentor. All passengers and crew aboard a Learjet perished when it exploded on impact with a crane while making its approach to the Grand Bahama International Airport last Sunday, where Pastor Monroe was set to host a church conference. His son Miles Jr. and daughter Carissa are the sole surviving members of the immediate Monroe family. More than one million Jewish children have been killed by abortion in Israel since 1948. Israel is currently engaged in a demographic war for its very survival as a Jewish state. Imagine what a difference one million more Jews would have made for Israel. Friends of Efrat saves the lives of thousands of children every year by providing support to pregnant women in distress. Since 1977, Efrat has saved over 30,000 lives and is recognized as a world leader in preventing abortions. You can play a major role in Israel's survival now by helping us save Israel's unborn children. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here on a beautiful day in Jerusalem on our rooftop studio. My guest today is member of Knesset Shimon Solomon. Member of Knesset Solomon, thank you for being on the show. Shalom. Member of Knesset Solomon, you're uh, originally from Ethiopia, and you made Aliyah, and you got all the way to the Knesset. Tell us a little bit about your personal story. Okay, my uh, uh, personal story is very, very long and very interesting. Uh, as uh, many people know, we Jewish, we lived as different in Ethiopia. We try for thousands of years to keep our Jewish in the life and we do it everything in order to keep to live according to the bible because this was the the reason of our life this is the education this is the conversation this is everything that we had this is the reason also that over than 95 percent from ethiopian jewish we lived in uh, in the villages as common uh, in order to keep the jewish in order to to live alone not uh, to go to to disappear so this was the education, and one day we start to go, like uh, the Egypt uh, history, by leg, just believing that we are going to. Uh, you, nobody can understand that because it was like crazy. Just to wake up to Jerusalem to west. I was a child. I came to Israel when I was 10 years old, and since I came here, I start again to dream how we can be here in Israel, uh, um, normal, civil, not to be behind. So this is the reason that I worked very hard, I dreamed always, I, I tried to achieve a high level as I can. So uh, in school, in army, in university, and now in Knesset, thanks God I am in good place that I can make change, I can help my people, I try to hear and also to do practical things. You know, there's a huge difference in culture between the Jews in Ethiopia and the Jews in Israel. How was that coming here as a 10-year-old? How did you adapt to the culture in Israel? It was very difficult. You know, we lived as Jewish and we tried to be, to to, 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 get, to involve, to be like as Jewish. But for us, it is very, very difficult because it's only for hours flight to Ethiopia, but the gap of the, the different cultures is like thousands of miles because we are blacks, we are very, very different culture, 
a traditional, everything is different. So the people in Israel also, they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't adopt us. Uh, they look us like outsiders, uh, which we, uh, they look us like Africans who have, you know, have ability. It's very difficult. And also we have also racism. So my perspective is that we have to do everything, everything in order to show that we have ability, we can achieve, we can be everywhere, we have uh, uh, the, the wiseness to be everywhere. So it is not easy. Until now, we have challenges, uh, stigmatizing, racism, uh, people who don't believe that we can do everything. So people like me, that in 30 years, we, the, we become as Knesset of member. Look at the history of America, for example. Hundreds of years until the equality, until the, the, you know, the opening of the society for all kinds of types of the people there. But here, in 30 years, you know, it's not only negative things. Also, we have uh, in the Holy Land, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, we try to be everything to involve. And uh, my, uh, my uh, 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 describe for the future is that if we will continue like now, I'm sure that we can be everywhere and by to show that we are working and, and we have the ability like everyone. You know, one of the big miracles of the Aliyah from Ethiopia for me was when we found the Ethiopian Jews, we realized that our Torah and the Torah that they had, even though they were cut off from Israel for 2,000 years, was letter for letter the exact same Torah. Was that something for the Ethio Ethiopian Jews, a, a great victory as well? Yes, yes. You know, for thousands of years, we believed that we are the only Jewish who, st who, who, st who rest in the world. So I remember the history in Ethiopia. The, uh, the white people, the Jewish, they came to Ethiopia, you know, to research, to ask how they, and the, the leaders of the religion or the Ethiopians, they said, the Ethiopian Jews, they said, first of all, show us that you have uh, Brit Mila. Circumcision. C circumcision. Show us. Uh, the second test is you have to stay until the night in order to be pure, you know, to be in the river, to stay in the, and then to come in our house. Because they didn't believe that other Jews they are in the world because wow. there was so strong religion, so strong in Ethiopia. You know what? Uh, the, the, the Christian of Ethiopia is copped. Yes. And they have the old test. It's uh, more and less. It's the same, like like or uh, like the Jewish Bible. So for thousands of years, we believe, we lived like very very equal, very respectable, and you know the Christian. Sometimes when they become uh, angry, they said the Jewish uh, Eloke Israel. Mm -hmm. Eloke Israel is the Jewish uh, Lord. The God of Israel. Yeah, it's uh, the Lord of Israel. So. You know, the, the connection between Ethiopian Jewish and, the, and the, the Christian in Ethiopia, it was something unique. I don't see in anywhere, and I'm, now I'm five, I'm uh, going everywhere in the world, and I don't see the relationship like Ethiopian and Christian, like uh, the, it was like that, because it was very unique, even in the kingdom of Ethiopia, in the castle, if you see the fence around, uh, in the fence, you see uh, the cross and the Megan David, the David star, in, in, in the yeah. same, it's to, uh, together. It show you, it's, it's say everything that the relationship between Christian and Ethiopian Jewish in Ethiopia. Amazing. Well, Member of Knesset Solomon, we literally have tens of millions of viewers watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? You know, my message is that, you know, when you see the Israel in television, it looks like a collab, uh, collab, war, and uh, and uh, uh, terror, and shooting everywhere. My message to 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 Christian, to to, to uh, the the other the people who who show us that it is very nice place to live in Israel, in Jerusalem, as you see in behind me. It is peace. It's good to come here to visit the holy places for all the religions. And it's not like in television that you see in the box, like wars. We have peace. We have very nice place to see. This is the place attractive for all the religions. And I invite you to come and to see it. Thank you, MK Solomon, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio.
It is heartbreaking to learn that there are over 40,000 abortions in Israel every year, many of which are due to financial concerns. The Efrat organization saves the lives of thousands of Jewish children each year by providing support to pregnant women in distress. Please help us save thousands more. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. The thing about that really characterizes this bridge is that no one is indifferent to it. Many people love it, some people hate it, but no one is indifferent to it. I use it every day. Uh, it means I don't have to go on the road, so I feel safe. It's like King David's harp, and uh, it's a significant monument in, uh, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem needs uh, modern architecture, but uh, it adds uh, value to it, modern and um, antiquity uh, fits uh, very well. It reminds me somewhat of, of a sailboat, a big, tall sailing ship, actually. And, and yet, with the light rail going by, then it kind of reminds me of Space Age. So it's kind of a nice mix. It's a new icon, uh, uh, near the old uh, icon. It's, and it's a, a symbol to the uh, movement of Jerusalem from old city to international city. If the simple people and the tourists come and they take picture, of the bridge uh, after they taken picture picture in the hotel on the old city so it's definitely come to be a, a new icon in uh, Jerusalem and it's the first steps to make Jerusalem international city there is a plan for intensive development for very tall buildings a traffic hub where two lines of the light rail will meet the heavy rail coming from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem will arrive at that point and there will be tall office buildings and hotels uh, in that uh, precinct. It somehow creates a new pattern for how we look at the way we move around in our city and how we look at our landscape. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. When Israel was established in 1948, it was exactly as the prophet Ezekiel foresaw. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cause you to come up from your graves, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Israel literally arose from the ashes of the Holocaust, one of the greatest miracles in human history. Still today, there are some 200,000 Holocaust survivors which still live in Israel. According to the Israeli government, there are still one third of them who are in need and live below the poverty line. Over the past three years, the Lord placed a unique opportunity before the International Christian Embassy to help those heroes who survived the darkest chapter of Jewish history. In December 2009, the aid department of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, ICEJ aid, was approached by Shimon Sabag, the director of the social welfare organization Yad Ezra Lehaver, who was looking for support for a special project. Having been shocked to see Holocaust survivors coming to his soup kitchen for food, he realized that there was a distinct need and began a project to house 14 survivors in the building next door to the offices of the organization. When we were actually approached by the organization at Ezra Haver in Haifa, uh, for Holocaust survivors, we somehow knew when we visited the project and visited the director that we had stumbled on something very unique. The project was very unique, there's nothing like it in the land and also the organization itself had a proven track record and we just knew that we had to uh, start working with them. 
Thanks to the generous giving of faithful Christian supporters worldwide, the ICEJ has assisted Yad Ezeleh Haver in achieving what was once just a dream, a neighborhood of multi-dwelling facilities able to provide practical care and a comfortable and safe home for more than 100 Holocaust survivors. When I actually first met him, Shimon had a, a great heart and lots of dreams, but his vision for this place was at the most to maybe house 20 people. And we started on this together, not knowing what would happen, and seeing in the end this amazing street full of buildings. The Haifa home for Holocaust survivors has captured the attention of the Israeli press and a number of Israeli leaders and dignitaries. At ceremonies marking the stages of completion, the attendance of senior government officials and leaders has given voice to the need to assist these individuals who have suffered so much. In the past year, the Haifa home dedicated a synagogue on its premises to provide a place for the survivors to participate in Shabbat services and observe Jewish holidays. The synagogue also provided the opportunity for some of the survivors to have their bar mitzvahs, since many of them were denied this rite of passage due to being interned in concentration camps. The Holocaust survivors are very old. They are from their end 70s into their 90s. And are quite a lot of them who are poor, they cannot live by themselves anymore, and who are lonely. And that's actually why it was so necessary to have a home for them, where they could feel cared for, and they would be able to live their life in security and uh, in a good atmosphere. I didn't expect in my life that I'm going to end up here, quiet, the price is right, I don't have to pay too much. And I'm so grateful to the International Christian Embassy. After all what we went through, they built for us a home where I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. I'm going to die here. and and. Uh, I am grateful to all the people in the world who are helping us. Please prayerfully consider what you can do in order to stand with us to help those last surviving heroes here in Israel. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Erin Viner. And I'm Rebecca Rand, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us next week for all of your Israel updates.